Welcome to the Bailiwick Express podcast. This is The Interview, one in a series of podcasts where we at the Bailiwick Express speak to members of our community about events, personal stories, politics, current events or charitable initiatives. Thank you for joining us. I'm Lester Carapel, and Dave and I went away together to London in 1975 to seek fame and fortune. We were the best of friends, dearest of friends. He had a 12-year career, internationally renowned as a poet and artist, and here we are at his graveside. How would you sum up David? Well, in my view, Dave was a one-off. He wasn't one in a million, he was a one-off. I never knew anyone like Dave. He was driven, absolutely driven. He was all or nothing. He could be the most infuriating person you've ever met in your life. And he could be the most endearing, the most compassionate, all in the same hour. He, He would drive you mad with something that he'd said or done. Because he was, he was very, um, sincere and he was, he was very compulsive. And sometimes he didn't think through the possible ramifications. So when we were in London, uh, we got involved in a few scrapes. Okay. Because of Dave saying, we need to do this. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, we do need to do this, but perhaps we need to think it through. But the next second he's done it. So we got into a few scrapes. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but sometimes we were lucky to get out of those. (laughs) But Dave was very trusting. He trusted anyone. He'd go into a bar or a nightclub and he'd start talking to anybody and he'd tell them his life story. And he'd trust them. He was very vulnerable, very gullible. He soon got streetwise, but between the time that he was very vulnerable in the big city, the, the, little, the guy from the little island in the big city, that was the time we had a few scrapes until he got streetwise. How did you first meet David Rebilliard? How, how did your friendship begin? OK, well, I was introduced to Dave by my, brig- my older brother Lyndon. My older brother Lyndon and Dave had worked for States Works on the road gang. That was 1970, so Dave was 18, I was 18. Lyndon was a couple of years older, and he said to me, you've got to meet this guy. He's so quirky, he's got, he, he, he's, he's got passion for absolutely everything. He's, like, full-on all the time. So I met Dave, and... And, and we hit it off right away. He had a very quirky sense of humour. And you had shared interests? Is that why your brother thought that you'd He said you'll get on really well with him. And he said, you know, because he's, he's, re- he's really into poetry, he's really into music. And uh, we met and we hit it off right away. And over the course of a few months, he wouldn't show anyone his poetry. He was so... He was so concerned and so worried about being labelled what he termed a sissy. Okay. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want people to think, because I write poetry, you know, I'm a sissy. I said, Dave, it's the wrong idea. That's mm. the wrong approach. Yeah. You know, what about Lord Byron? What about Yeats? What are all the famous poets, Coleridge and all those poets? So eventually, over a course of a few months, I managed to persuade him to show me some of his poems. Mm-hmm. And they were really astounding. Absolutely. Yeah. He used to nail things with just a few sentences. And I said, you've got to share these. You can't just hide them away all the time. So he said, I've even destroyed some. But I said, don't destroy any more. Yeah. You know, you've got to share them. People want to see these. He said, do you think so? I said, yeah, well, look, you know, you've, they've t- touched me, so they're bound to touch other people. So eventually he got confidence to share a few of them with, um, with very close friends like, like Lyndon, my brother, and Laurie, my, my younger brother. We used to encourage him to write and encourage him to share. And, and this was still as a teenager? This was 18, yeah, 18, going on 19, yeah. He's probably 19 before he shared things. As a teenager, you know, growing up, you can understand that feeling of vulnerability. But So by the time he was 19, he'd made friends that were encouraging that outlet for him and encouraging him to share. You're right, you're right. Because I said, you know, Dave, I don't care what people think about me. I'm a poet. I write poetry, I write lyrics and songs. If somebody doesn't like it, that's their problem. It's not mine. You, know, you just got to get it out there. 
So I think Lyndon and Laurie and I had a huge influence on him getting his stuff out, out yeah. there to, to share his stuff. Because he saw that we just we were just proud of our stuff. You know, we wanted to share it. We weren't bothered about being called sissies. And two and two together obviously inspired him to to, to share a lot of his stuff. Mm -hmm. Although it was it was it wasn't with everybody. He was very particular about who he shared it with. Yeah. To start with. And it, it was nothing like the stuff that it, he evolved into some very graphic in your face stuff. It was more from a lonely person who was desperate for love. His, his parents loved him dearly, his family loved him dearly, his yeah. sister Jane and Wendy loved him dearly. I'm not talking about that kind of love, I'm yeah. talking about a one to one. Yes. He was looking for mm -hmm. that connection, that support, that love. And he used to write a lot about that. Um, but he was, a, he was an observer. He, right. he was very, he'd sit for hours and look at people and he'd write one line and he'd, he'd work on it later. He'd do a sketch and very different to what he evolved, eventually evolved yeah. into. I mean, you said he was working on the road gang with your brother. Yeah. Um, do you think that influenced his poetry writing then? You know, observing people, I guess, at work. You know, it did. there must have been an opportunity for people watching on, during his breaks and Absolutely. things like that. Absolutely. Indeed. Yeah, he did. He, he wrote about all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, it wasn't primarily all about Dave. It was about yeah. people because he was a people watcher. He, yeah. And he's very, peop very much a peop people person. I mean, he's lost, he lost money trusting people. Okay, even at that young age? Yeah, and, and, and in London, we both lost money because Dave got us into a few scrapes. <laughs> I wouldn't change a minute, don't you? I'm not yeah. saying that. I wouldn't change a minute of it. When did the London, the London adventure begin then for, for the pair? You went together? Yeah, what happened was I went to London on my own in okay. 72. And how old were you, would you have been then? I would have been 20. I'd finished my apprenticeship and I wanted to experience life in the city as opposed to life in an island. It didn't really work out very well. Um, I ended up doing the same things I do in London as I do in Guernsey. Okay. You know, like going to work, eight to five, um, shopping, cooking, eating, sleeping. It was nothing really. Yeah. Although I did get to see a... Ah, actually, no, I'm misleading you there. I, I'd never... I wanted to see a lot of groups because I was music crazy. That's the big difference between me going to London and me staying here. I saw so many groups I've always okay. wanted to see. And, and th that was terrific. But apart from that, I got disillusioned. So I came back after eight months. And then what happened was Dave and I spent... It, uh, a lot, a lot of time together developing um, I, I used to write songs, he used to help me with lyrics he used to write his own poems and we actually put a couple of concerts on uh, at a little theatre so he was getting it was, Dave was like if you coil an elastic band up in your hand and let it go the elastic band just springs out yes. all over the place, that was Dave Okay. it was like he'd been released you know, he'd found people to 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 be creative with and be, be artistic with and to express himself with. And it was like his mum his mum called him the bird. Okay. Because he was a bird in a cage. Who needed to get his wings. The, the cage door needed to be opened. And when the cage door was opened, <laughs> it's when we went to London. That's when the bird that was it. flew. Yeah. And so in 74, I said to him, I've got to do this now. I've got to go back to London, but this time to try and make it as a musician. Because uh, otherwise, I'm just going to end up playing in Guernsey. Um, and I really want a profession as a musician. So I said, I've got to go. I've really got to go back to London. So he said, I'd like to come along with you, but I don't know if my mum and dad would be all right with that. So I said, well, just ask them. Yeah. So we asked them, and they realised that he needed to express, you know, spread his wings. Um, so in 1975, 
and we were both 23. So that's when we went to, to London. If I can just say that, that's a sign actually of um, his close relationship with his family then, which I know you alluded to yeah. before you mentioned his sisters who are both still... Very close to his you, family. You, you're still in contact with. But yeah, he obviously had that close relationship. He was concerned how his parents would feel about yeah. him going to London. But they said, yes, go and do it. They gave him, his bless- they gave yeah. him their blessing. Yeah, they, they didn't know what he was going to do. Um, they knew that I was going to go and try and make a career out of being a musician. Dave just wanted to get to a city. Yeah. He wasn't sure. He still wasn't confident. He lacked a look, lacked confidence for a long, long time. He still wasn't confident. He's quite prepared to go to London, get an eight to five job, which we both did for a while, um, and just let things evolve. Yeah. So he had no idea. Um, he was going to just carry on with his art and his poetry. But he used to he used to he used to do little drawings at the table and leave them on the table and I said you can't leave that there you've got to build up a portfolio David Billiard's art he said well if you want it my friend take it so I've got a few of those yeah Um, there's one wow and this is one as you said he just drew he just did it on the table and he left it there it was called Give One Heart and I I wrote a song called Give, Give One Heart yeah and uh, he he did this two hearts blending melding. Yeah. But this was this this was forty five years ago, probably. So I had it framed because I didn't want to um, get it damaged. Yeah. So yeah, so he just leave them laying around. and said, "You can yeah. have them if you want them." Eventually, wow. very naively, we thought. If we get jobs as night porters at a hotel, we can network in the daytime and meet the right people. Not thinking through that you, you're doing a 12-hour shift from 8 till 8. You're exhausted. You've then got to go shopping for food and stuff and got to eat and cook and look after yourself. <laughs> yeah, try and get some sleep if you can. So that didn't work out and we were exhausted. So we only stuck that for a month. We did that for a month. And we actually ended up on the bus going back home, missing the stop sometimes because we were asleep on the bus. Oh, right. We were that exhausted. Yeah. But because Dave was driven, he had a lot more energy than me. He was actually driven. He had this compulsion. And I've been... uh, And further, later on, when we started to meet people, um, he was very good at meeting complete strangers get introduced to a friend of a friend of a friend and he had the resilience to, to see that right through whereas I'd be out on my feet you know I'd be exhausted I said we're not going to get anywhere with this he said leave it to me and the next thing I knew he'd met people that were going to be influential um, or could be possibly influential yeah we gave money to some people who ripped us off but that's yeah. all part of the as you said, he, part of the game, isn't he, it? David was gullible yeah. in those early years living in London, and and you said you know you found it difficult. So I, I, and that I, was part I, of the journey. For I those I thought you know I said Dave, we can't be doing this, we can't be doing that, we can't be doing the other. And I thought to myself, why am I so authoritarian? <laughs> it's because I wanted us to both be successful and not be ripped off. But there was a balance to be struck between me thinking this is the way to go to the way Dave thought this is the way to go and in the middle eventually we found that that path so after about two years of absolute struggle and I'm talking about real struggle it's the classic struggle of an artist and a musician a basement with no electric and no running water and no bathroom all that kind of stuff you know um, living with a friend who had a room that wasn't being used but the reason it wasn't being used was because it was horribly damp and all sorts of horrible stuff yeah. which you put up with when you're young and you're As desperate. part of the struggle. Yeah. yeah. So we put up with all that struggle for a couple of years and he'd come home often, often well not even home sometimes and when we were out he'd say look there's so and so, we've got to meet them we've got to go introduce ourselves. And I'd say, I'm exhausted, mate. And I'd say, well, leave it to me, I'll do all the talking. 
and he had that drive and he, he switched on he could be exhausted equally exhausted he, you know but he'd switch on okay. when he knew that connection had to be made yeah something within him that drive mm -hmm. that compulsion used to switch on and he'd, he'd be really really full of energy and what was he so obviously your intention was to make it as a professional musician was there a particular avenue that David was following? There was his poetry and music by association with the poetry, I'm guessing, and his his um, artwork. There was a performance element as well with his creativity? Yeah, he, he was very shy. He didn't like to be on the stage. OK. Um, but he, he wanted to support me. OK. Well, I was very honoured to, 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 to have that support initially, to support me, to get me to where I wanted to go, not thinking of... He had a talent okay. as well. So eventually, um, we used to meet all sorts of people and we did we did things like, he saw an advertisement in the stage magazine for two extras with just a couple of lines in a play. And he said, we should go for that. We could meet people. It was yeah. in the Fringe Theatre. It was the, it was the Half Moon Theatre in, in, um, in the East End, which is a very prestigious theatre in those days. And uh, it was an Eamon Andrews funded organisation. Yeah. Which was an, a, a, a director called Gerald Jacarello, who I'd never heard of, but apparently was big mm -hmm. on the Fringe Theatre. Uh, in Fringe Theatre. So Dave said, We've got to go along. You never know who we're yeah. going to meet. So we went along, and I said, But you don't like being on the stage. He said, oh, I'll handle it. It's just a couple of lines. We were henchmen. We were sidemen to this guy Hatchet. So you got the role. We got the role. Yeah. Eventually got the role. He, we went for an interview, and I said, yeah. "I said I don't know what to say." I said, "We're not actors." He said, "Let me do all the talking." <laughs> so, <laughs> you so, can see why you got into scrapes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Oh, let me do all the talking. Just come along for the ride. <laughs> yeah, and and I trusted him implicitly, and, and he had that gift. And I'm, I'm not saying he lied to people, but he had that gift to convince people that we need to be given a chance. We had a week of rehearsals and then the two weeks of rehearsals and the second week was really getting everything refined. He did a week and then he said to me one day, I can't do this. I said, well, you've got a week to go, we can't do it, we're opening in a week. He said, I can't do it. He said, I haven't got the confidence. He said, I, I'm really not comfortable standing up on there on a the stage. So I said, well, we can't let them down. No, it's, it, it's like, it, it's, it's a big production. It, it was a 70-seater fringe theatre, the most prestigious fringe theatre in, in the whole of, the, of, of London. And it was already sold out for like a three-week run. It was already sold out six six nights a week. He said, don't worry, I'll find somebody else. And he went and found somebody else to take his part. Quite incredible. Yeah. And it was a wonderful experience. In, in Fringe Theatre, you meet people coming up or people coming down. So there was a couple of very, very experienced actors there who'd fallen on hard times. I remember a guy called Vaz Anderson, who was in things like The Saint, you know, and Coronation Street and mm -hmm. all those kind of things for years, but then he'd fallen on hard times. Um, so you, you just get to talk to them. And they introduce you to someone who introduces you to someone else. And when you've got Dave alongside you, and you're thinking, I don't know what to say, and, I've, and I'm exhausted anyway, you just leave it to Dave. Because he could talk to anyone, you said. Yeah. He would talk to anyone, yeah. he trusted everyone, he was very good at convincing mm. people that you needed to give newbies a chance. Yeah. Um, and eventually got to meet various people, and he got me a part. I didn't want to be an actor, but I saw the merit and the value in being involved in the theatre. Yep. He got me a part in another play in... Um, uh, Islington um, no sorry Elephant Castle Elephant Castle Arts Centre and because I'd been in Hatchet in the prestigious Half Moon they thought I was a, something quite yeah. special so <laughs> they, they were soon disappointed but um, but Dave got me that part yeah. and that was another run of about three weeks and in the meantime he was meeting all sorts of people he was hanging out at the art centres meeting all sorts of people and Lots of false starts along the way. Um, money handed over to people who said they could be our agent, um, but it didn't turn out that way. 
eventually, I'm jumping forward a bit, he got to meet Gilbert and George. Okay, and they were very influential they on his They gave future. him a start. Yeah. They're the ones that gave him the start. So Gilbert and George, though, who are Gilbert, Gilbert and George? Gilbert and George were the, 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 the renowned gay artists, internationally renowned gay artists, Gilbert and George, who'd been on the scene for many, many years. Okay, so um, they were already established and, and well-known, renowned. Yeah, and they were touched by Dave's work. Dave was, Dave was, Dave had evolved then to doing other, other bigger pictures. He was always wanting to do, do big stuff. Yeah. So in the end, Dave ended up doing like six foot square, and there'd, there'd be some kind of slogan, some faces. He was, he was, he was a people person. He was obsessed. If he saw someone with an interesting face, or an interesting way of walking, or an interesting way of standing. You know, he kept that characteristic yeah. and he tried to get it uh, onto one of his paintings. So he evo- he was evolving into that all the time. And this was the late seventies. This would this would have been seventy seven seventy eight. Okay. But he had other people on the way who who helped him. In the meantime, my my musical career wasn't taking off, and I'd had loads of interviews, loads of auditions. But my musical career wasn't taking off at all. So. I was fed up of struggling because we squatted for quite a while because squatters had rights in those days. If you signed a contract with the council that you were going to look after, not only look after the house, but improve it, and they turned the electric on, turned the water on. So we squatted for, in fact, I've got a photograph of Dave doing some pointing outside of the house because he worked with his father, who was a labourer for a while as well. So he was very, very knowledgeable building and stuff. A useful person to be squatting with. Absolutely. <laughs> but he got us to squat. He got us to squat in Portobello Road. He said to me one day, I met some guys that are squatting in Portobello Road. They said there's a couple of spare rooms. And I thought, hmm, is this going to be another one of those? <laughs> Hand money over and never see it again. So he said, no, no, he said, I, I trust them. I said, well, you can trust anyone. <laughs> and one day, you know, but you're learning. You're learning. And um, every time something would go horribly wrong something would bounce it up by going wonderfully right so we ended we went to see these guys in Portobello Road and the whole street was squatted and I said this can't be true Portobello Road you know squatting and put living in Portobello Road this can't be true little two little old guys from Guernsey but it happened we, we squatted there for about eight months I think and uh, it, 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 it he actually one day he came home and, uh, and he said, I, I've met a guy from Guernsey in the bakery. I said, who's that? He said, do you know Errol Groves? I said, well, I've heard the name. He said, well, he's coming around in a minute. <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> oh, okay, that's fine. So Errol came around and we did, we did a picture, which I've got actually. It's, it's, it's the original. We sat down at the table and we said, right, let's do a picture. You start that corner, I'll start this corner, and I'll start, and I'll start in the middle. So we did this picture, which is totally bizarre, totally surrealistic, totally off the wall, but wonderful. Uh, I think it's wonderful. I would do because I, I contributed to it, but <laughs> but it's quite it's quite something. Um, and Dave was Dave was a great one for detail. He spent hours little mosaic shapes mm-hmm. just to get the effect and he was very patient and he was he was evolving and all the time very different art to what he ended up doing but you can see the way he was evolving if if he if he'd spent time with him and also his his character he was getting more and more confidence and he was getting more and more um he was getting more and more aware that he shouldn't trust people. So he was he was getting streetwise. So I'm jumping forward now to when, after a lot of false starts, my musical career wasn't going anywhere. So my logical brain said to me, get a job in a record shop. Still in London, this yeah. is. Still, and yeah. you might meet some musicians yeah. or some people involved in the music business. And it was a good move, because I did. It didn't actually turn out to be what I thought it was going to turn out to be, but there were a lot of musicians 
a lot of the right people were working within that record and there was I remember people had been in bands actually got a job in a record shop right. because they just wanted to be involved in music there was a guy called Dave Jordan he worked for the Stones he was he was Keith Richards uh, on the road assistant but when Keith got busted in Toronto the Stones had to come off the road so they all the road crew had to look for work so Dave Jordan came to came to work at uh, Price Records and he actually went on to be a producer for selector so it's those kind of people but of course they're all struggling they're all we're all in the same boat we're all struggling so it, it never really worked out but in the meantime Dave's career was going from strength to strength um, then after after nearly three years our price record sold to WH Smith and the whole thing changed and then I didn't realize that if you don't come back after five years you lose your local market status so I said to Dave um, I've been here, f we've been here four years and 11 months. It's time to make a decision. He said, well, I'm not going back. <laughs> I said, well, I don't blame you because you're getting, you know, you're making, you're making inroads into what you want to do. But I'm going to go back to Guernsey for a while. So I came back to Guernsey and Dave stayed there, of course, and he had 13, he had just over 12 years, almost 13 years in London, living the dream. He was doing exactly what he wanted to do. Yeah. And it's like his mum, she nailed it when she called him the bird in the cage yeah. in Guernsey. The cage door's got to be open. So the was Guernsey fly his out. cage, do you think? And then in London he was yeah. free? Or? Yeah, it was, because he said to me, when I get to London, I'm not going to do the same things I get I do in Guernsey. And I said, well, I did that last time. He learned as he went along, mistakes, you make mistakes to, to, to get the breaks. But as I said earlier, fortunately, balance stop with the good stuff would come along and he'd, tell, he'd say something like oh I met so and so today and I thought why wow, did you do that oh I just walked into this club and I started talking to this chap you want to go and introduce yourself to so and so and all this sort of stuff and it was that characteristic of Dave's that actually got him the success that he needed the gull gullibility that you mentioned earlier that obviously leaves you vulnerable doesn't it if you're yeah. very trusting and you believe people so as he's becoming more streetwise and making his way as an artist yeah. there was inevitably times where he would get hurt very very hurt and he was a very sensitive guy he could be very he, he, he could he could almost be hard-nosed businessman like but he could also crumble within a few minutes he would put a lot of trust in someone and if they let him down, he was so disappointed and so hurt, he'd go and hide. He'd lock himself away. And you could knock on the door, he said, I'm not coming out. So he was that sensitive. Um, and, and, and like I say, he was, he was extreme. And I don't mean that as a criticism, I mean it in the, in, in, in the nicest possible way. It was a roller coaster. You'd be up on the top of the roller coaster. Yeah. Everything would be going great. And the next thing you knew, you were down at the bottom. And then you'd be back up again. But he wanted to stay on that roller coaster. He he chose yeah. to stay in London. Yeah, I was coming um, back to Guernsey because I didn't want to lose my local market status yep. because I couldn't see a career, whereas Dave could see a career ahead of him. And he, he said, what am I going to go back to Guernsey for? I said, oh, no, I, I hear you, you know, I hear what you're saying. Did he ever come back to Guernsey? Holidays. Holidays. So he did come back yeah. to visit family. As you said, they were very close. Yeah. And, and your friendship the was right He used yeah. to write the most amazing letters. He used to go into great detail. And we'd talk on the phone all the time. And he'd come over. And, and when my wife and I just got, just, just got married, um, he'd come and stay with us. He'd sleep on the couch. And it was great, you know, because you had more time with him. And yes, he'd see his family, his mum and dad and his sisters. Then when my son was born, and Blaine was born, he stayed with us, I think he stayed with us three times. And we were trying to buy a house at the Port Swath the last time he came over. And we asked him to be godfather to Blaine, and he broke down. Thank you, he said, I'm so touched. He said, I'll treat Blaine, I'll love him like I love my own son, because I'm never going to have any children. So he knew he was never going to have any children. So he was so touched by that, you know, he was so, so touched. A very, very, very sensitive yeah. person. But at the same time, as I say, could be almost like give you the impression he's a hard-nosed hard -nosed businessman. Yeah. So it was very extreme. It, it was almost like, I need to be this, so I'll be that. 
I need to be this now, so I'll be that now. I need to be this now. Oh, but I'm hurt. And when he was hurt, he didn't have any control okay. over that. He had to just heal. But he knew then that he needed almost to shut himself away, as you said, not come out of his room for a couple of days. Yeah. Like a self-preservation mode. Yeah. But so, while he was in his room, he'd be writing and painting. Yes. So he wasn't just laying there moping. So it was an outlet yeah. for his creativity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're into the 1980s. Yeah, I came back in late 79, Christmas 79, November 79, actually. Yeah. And the friendship continued through oh, absolutely. letter writing and absolutely. phone calls. Absolutely, writing, phone calls, and, and, and Dave would come over. Yeah. I went over there... Um, once before my wife and I got married we went over to, to, to meet him uh, to see him um, and Jackie had never met him and she just absolutely loved the guy she just fell in love with his personality straight away and people did that my brothers loved him my mum and dad adored him my, my, sometimes he'd come round he'd be a bit too much because sometimes this is where I'm talking about the extreme when we used to live at the lodge full on lodge we're at, we're at the graveside now. Yeah. And when we used to live at the lodge, my dad, my dad was caretaker. Dave would come along every day, but my dad would be out at work because he, yeah. he, he had caretaker duties and he wouldn't see him much. So uh, even on a Saturday, my dad used to work as, as his caretaker duties. On a Sunday, he'd say, is Dave coming around today? And we'd say, no. He's been round every other He's day. He's been round six <laughs> times this week. <laughs> you can have too much of a good thing. And my dad would be really upset. Cause he'd be, yeah. But I haven't seen him. So you either connected with Dave or, or you didn't. Okay. And most people I know connected with Dave in that big way. That they just, they loved being around him. Mm -hmm. They loved him being around. They loved, they, you know. Some people would say, he got on your nerves. I could see where they're coming from, but not to the point that you'd purposely exclude him, because he'd be very hurt by that. But you, you, like I said, Dave was a one-off. He wasn't a one in a million. He was a one-off. He was like he said to me when we first got to London. He said, "This is like being a child let loose in a sweet shop." <laughs> He was going to try all the sweets, yeah. make himself sick, but he had to try all the sweets. And that's when I used to try and say, be a bit careful. We need to be a bit streetwise mm. here. So after you came back to Guernsey, though, do you think he was... Did he have anyone there telling him to be careful and trying to keep him yes, under control? Yes, he'd made some really almost. good contacts. Okay, good. He had made some good friends by yeah, then. So they were also looking after him. Yeah, yeah. he, he knew he could... He actually found people he could trust. To a certain extent, okay. A couple of them, I'm not going to name them. You know, led him on a merry dance, okay. and he was hurt by that, very hurt by that. But he did have a, a circle yeah. of, of people around him, and I knew he was going to be okay because he was streetwise yeah. by then. It was nearly five years by then, and he learnt quickly. He learnt very quickly. He was very. He was tough. He was a tough character. He'd been on building sites. He'd been on the road gangs. Okay, night porter isn't very physical. But it was something we thought we had to do to give ourselves a day's free, yes. not thinking you need to sleep and, and eat. And if you've done a 12 hour shift, you haven't got much energy. But he had other jobs. But he worked in a record shop as well. We met a guy who was in the London Symphony Orchestra. I can't quite remember how we met all these people. I can't quite remember how we met them. It may have been through a friend of, a friend of mine actually. He actually ran the record shop in Bow Street, or Bow Lane, and he needed an assistant. Because Dave had got to know him, and eventually Dave got the job. So Dave, we both worked in record shops at one stage, which was a great experience, and he loved it. But it was always with the intention as it's a stepping stone. He actually went back, he got desperate. We, we, we went through some really desperate times. Um, he went back working on a building site. But of course, that was, that was normal. You know, it wasn't like it was alien to him. Yeah. He, was, he was a very artistic, very creative man who mm -hmm. could be tough yeah. when he needed to be. So it, he learned very fast. And networking and getting to know people, I've never seen anyone like it. 
never seen anyone like it. I'd be saying, you know, you can't go and talk to that person. You know, I've heard all sorts of tales about them. Oh, but that's just tales. You know, I want to get to know the real person. <laughs> and, well, I'll tell you one thing. We went to Stonehenge Festival. In those days, it was, it was a festival at Stonehenge for three days. And we went there with a crowd of people from Portobello Road in two, two vans. We'd been there for an hour and Dave disappeared. I didn't see him for three days. <laughs> and it was a huge site. Yeah. There was like 40,000 people there. All over the site. You know, and I used to go... I went to tents, loads of tents. Yeah. Have, you, have you seen a guy, Dave, long black hair? He had long hair in those days. Um, a small beard. Um, very energetic, almost childlike. Very enthusiastic. No. So I gave up after about a day because some of the guys at Portobello Road said, you should know Dave by now. Leave him alone. He's doing his own thing. And they were right. Yeah. He was doing his own thing. We were packing up to leave on the third day and he appeared. <laughs> I said, I was really worried about you. He said, I've had a great time. He said, I haven't got any money left. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a great time. I was with the orange people over there. I was with so-and-so over there. I went up with so-and-so over there. And he wanted that experience. Yeah. He wanted you to. <laughs> so who am I to stop him, you know? Yeah. It, although I th used to think he's going to get hurt. I wanted, wanted to help him to protect. I thought, well, who am I? I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm, what authority have I got? So he had all these experiences. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it shaped him. It shaped him into the person and what, that he was. And, and he used to come out and he's writing. He used to come out and he's, he's painting. Because he was a people person. Yeah. And he was getting that um, professional success then while he was alive. So during the 1980s, there were exhibitions. He was heavily sponsored by Gilbert and George. Yeah. I can't emphasize that enough. If it yeah. wasn't for Gilbert and George, I don't know if okay. Dave would have had the career that, he, that, he, that he's having yeah. and he's had. He was heavily sponsored by Gilbert and George. They set up, they, they published his first book. They set up his first exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, they introduced him to other people. Yeah. And who then took a chance and sponsored mm -hmm. him for other things. In his lifetime, there were two books of poems published and what they called a box of poems, which was cards in a box. After he died, there was a lot more published, but in his lifetime, there was two books and a box of poems. And but there are exhibitions, yeah, as well. And he used to go along to those exhibitions, and he'd just sit there, wait for people to come in, they talk to him, and yeah. he'd, he'd sign pictures as they bought. And he started to sell, but not huge amounts, mm -hmm. enough to to give people and George, like Gilbert and George, confidence that because they loved the person Dave was, but they were businessmen as well. Yeah, yeah. they couldn't afford to lose money. So they, yeah, they, they sponsored another exhibition and he started to sell, you know, in dribs and drabs a little bit at a time. Yeah. Um, when he came back to Guernsey, he stayed with my wife and I. And I set him up an interview with Jim Delbridge at BBC Guernsey. And I always remember this after the interview, at the end of it, Jim said, so what's 1988 going to bring for David Billy? Yeah. And, and Dave said, more. And Jim said, more what? He said, more exhibitions, more books, more everything. I can't wait to get out. I can't wait to get started. Um, but of course, he died in 88. He died in November 88. But he hadn't been diagnosed with AIDS at, at that time. So he was still a very enthusiastic. Um, it, as I say, it, I've never known a person like Dave. I, I could be down and out and, and, and thinking, well, we're down and out. We're in a mess here. And he'd pull something out the bag. Yeah. Just like that. When we lost, we got we got evicted from Portobello Road. Oh, I know someone. I know someone in Brixton. They said there's a house there. He got us another yeah. another house. It was all about meeting people. So if we go to so late 1987, then um, when he had the interview with Jim Delbridge, he was back in Guernsey. Yeah. Was that the last time you saw David? It's the last time I saw him. Um, but you spoke to him during. Spoke to him and wrote wrote. We used to we, we used to try and outdo each other writing writing letters. Right? If I wrote a twenty page letter, he'd write a twenty one <laughs> page letter. You know, <laughs> it doesn't matter if there's one word on the page. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but yeah, I mean, it was it was always a terrific, uh, terrific friendship. Yeah. Terrific, uh, terrific bond, terrific connection. If I can ask, then, were you aware he was ill when that time came, or so did you know that the end was coming for Dave, or did his death come as a a, a shock I out knew of nowhere? He, I knew he was ill um, when he left Guernsey the last time I saw him here. No sign of him being ill. Mm. Nothing. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I got a call several months later, um, saying he, he was he was ill. And uh, uh, gosh, it was, this is going to be. There's no cure for this. This is the end. Horrendous. Um, and it came quickly. Nightmare. Yeah, November. He, he died in November. But. Um, I got a few phone calls um, from Dave and from family members as well. And, and Jane and Wendy said, we're going to go across to see Dave. He's in hospital. Uh, this is towards the end. We don't mm-hmm. think it's, it's going to be a, a very long. And I, I, I really persecuted myself for this for many, many years. But... I was having my own problems. My marriage was breaking up. My business was losing money. Uh, we had a son, only two and a half years old. And I thought, well, do I really want to see Dave in a hospital bed anyway? And not be able to breathe, not be able to talk. Do I really want to see that? So the, like, I answered my own question, no, I don't. I don't, want to, I don't want that to be my last picture of Dave. I want the last memory of Dave to be when, I, when he was here, staying with Jackie and I. And he was full of life. Yeah, you know? just a few months earlier. Probably, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but then I got a phone call f- from Jane's husband. Said, "You better sit down, mate. If you're not sitting down, because this is well, the bad news. Uh, Dave's gone." And um, his mum and dad went over as well. His mum, they're all over. And Gilbert and George are very helpful. Very helpful, very supportive. You know, they they found him a place to stay and everything. Very supportive. And just getting on to the funeral, um, my dad was still caretaker of the Fulham Cemetery. The funeral was a very, very sad affair. But Andrew, Dave's partner, came over, and it was Andrew that said, Can we put poet and artist on Dave's headstone? Which is a lovely touch. There were 73 wreaths from all over the world. Wow. And my father said, there has been nothing anywhere near. There was a mountain of wreaths, and he was caretaker here for many years. So he saw lots of funerals. He saw lots of funerals. He said, you might see a dozen. Yeah. 15, yeah. 73 wow. wreaths from all over the world. That's how much he was loved. When you think he died in 88, how come the rest of the world has heard of him and very few people here have. I can't really answer that question. No. Well, a few months ago I approached you and I, I did not know about him. I googled and there's a wealth of information online, as yeah, you said. He's all over it. <laughs> Everyone else knew, knows about him, but, you know, I, I grew up in Guernsey. I work in the media and I didn't know about him. So he has got a legacy. This isn't a new thing that, you know, we're, we're not discovering him for the first time. Oh. He's been discovered decades ago, but there are a lot of Guernsey people that maybe don't know about him. Um, his work is celebrated yeah. in many, many places. There, an exhibition as recently yeah. as a decade ago, 20, there, there was was that, 26 an, years after he died. There was so. an exhibition which, at the time, Joanna, Joanna Little John was the head of the yes. Arts Commission. yeah. Um, Russ has taken Russ Fossey has taken over from her, but Joanna was the head of arts, arts uh, commission at that time. And I'd been talking to Joanna. And I said, you know, it's a great shame. That we really should do something to, to, to promote Dave, get his name out there. And uh, she said, you're right. But a David Billiard exhibition wouldn't probably justify. Uh, all the effort so she came up with the idea why don't we do a combined exhibition um, it, and, and David Billiard so it was it was Damon Hurst 
Picasso, somebody else, and Rebilliard. That's a great idea. So that's what we. That's what she did. Do you think David would have ever expected to have his name mentioned alongside artists like Picasso? Oh, he'd have been touched. <laughs> he would have been. He would have been so touched. Yeah. He'd, he. I mean, and to be celebrated by in the Gay Pride Week by Liberate, he'd be so touched. He was a very humble man. Yeah. He wasn't. He wasn't. It wasn't his ego that drove him. It was just his passion, his desire mm-hmm. to create. Yeah. You know, and. Alpha Waring was very supportive as well. She used to run the, the press sh- shop in Smith Street. Yeah. She dedicated a whole window to that exhibition. And she said, I'm going to feature Dave, prominently yeah. feature Dave. Mm. So people were getting behind. And, OK, we're 10 years on. But it, 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 it's happening again, you know. It's, and, and this looks like it's going to be the, the year of Dave. Because it's a play being written about him. A playwright in England is writing a play. Liberate are going to celebrate him on Gay Pride Week. We're talking about a blue plaque, but that's all it is at the moment. Yeah. Um, and where would that go? Where was his family home in Guernsey? Delisle Farm. Okay. Was, was, it's just an idea at the moment. Plaque is just an idea. But there are ways it, Guernsey could celebrate this phenomenal man as it as it says on his grave is it poet and artist yeah so we could celebrate his work as it is celebrated elsewhere or recognize perhaps the um the achievements he had in a life cut short and the legacy he's left yeah. as well and, and it is time it, you know it's 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 beyond time but but at least it's happening now mm-hmm. um and, and thank goodness it is because liberate raising the profile um I suppose, in a sense, Dave's been pushed aside. I suppose, in a sense, not purposely, mm. but other things take over, don't yeah. they? And, and it's come to now. It, it's it's going to be the year of Dave. So that's yeah. the way I see it. And it, it, it's the time when, if people in Guernsey, if there are still people in Guernsey that haven't heard of Dave by the end of the year, then. Perhaps it's because they don't read the paper. Perhaps it's yeah, because they're, they're not, not interested in art. Listening. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps it's because you know, it, it, you know, it's, it, you, you can't. I'm not. You, I wouldn't in any way criticise anyone for for not wa- wanting to to see his work. Um, it, it's it's personal stuff, uh, but at least the effort would have been made. You know, Gay Pride Week that'll be all over the yeah. all over the media. But yeah. we don't want to reflect him as being a gay artist and poet I think is how you said it earlier he was an artist and poet and he was a gay man yeah he but was he wasn't an artist and a poet because he was gay yeah he, he was an artist and a poet because he was driven by art and poetry because that of was who him. he was that was yeah. yeah that was him yeah I'm still in touch with a couple of the guys that, that still promote Dave Dave is heavily promoted out outside of the island by by, by various people actually there have been exhibitions held um in 2014, going back again to 2014, I was invited to the, the launch of an exhibition of Dave's in ICA in Mel, in the Mall in London, a very prestigious gallery. Lots of people there, you know, in, in the art world. And uh, I was touched and I was really honoured to be invited. And I went along and I met a few of the people that still promote Dave now to this day. Yeah. And I'm in touch with them now. Um, to this day, it, it's it's ironic that when you go on the internet, you put David Billiard in, and you're going to get a whole raft of stuff coming up about. Some of Wikipedia's um, information is wrong, so yeah. So you, you sometimes Wikipedia don't quite get their facts their facts right. So yeah. So if anyone reading Wikipedia, some of the things aren't quite correct. But you're happy, if anyone wants to talk about David Rebilliard and his art and his life, you're clearly happy to talk about it. Um, yeah. And for someone who died before the age of the internet, there's loads of examples of his artwork yeah. online. Yeah. And perhaps we will see further exhibitions. I'm sure we will. Um, yeah. If you run through the, the exhibitions that have taken place since Dave died, well, he died in 88, there was an exhibition 
Wow. In 89, you know, 90, 91, 92, 93, and the, one I, the other one I was referring to, 2014. And books that have been published since his death. Yeah. There's a whole raft of them, you see, a whole raft on there. Apparently the Tate has got two of his pictures. But when I phoned the Tate, they said they hadn't, so I'd... I'll have to phone the Tate again to clarify that. And see if you can track that. them down. Maybe they're in storage, you know, maybe mm-hmm. they're not on display. Um, but I know that not long after he died, um, the Royal Festival Hall on the South Bank purchased two of his pictures and they were hanging up in the uh, reception, the foyer area. It's classic, isn't it? Somebody lives their lives in poverty, a struggling artist lives their lives in poverty, and when they die they become collectible. And how do you think David would feel, though, about decades after his death? We're sitting here talking about him and there there have been exhibitions and books published of his work, possibly more. You know, he is now revered and respected. He'd be very touched because he he wasn't egotistical. He'd be very... He'd he'd feel honoured, actually. I know that. I know he'd feel honoured. And it's almost to the point of not quite believing it. What, celebrating me, you know, and, and, and you know, he. he I, I always got the impression that as hard as he worked, he couldn't quite believe that he was having success. Okay. Couldn't quite believe because of that lack of confidence that was in him throughout his life. You think that persisted? He, that he, lack of confidence. Yeah, he couldn't quite believe that people like my what, like my art. They like my poetry. Wow, this is amazing. So he'd be very touched, very honoured. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you at the beginning. Now we've perhaps awoken a few memories and you know recalled some of the scrapes that you got into, but obviously David's success as well. How do you sum him up? That's incredibly difficult to do because I could talk for hours. I, I am talking for hours about Dave. Um, he was the most infuriating at times. <laughs> The most wonderful person to be around with all the time. Very giving person. He was a giver by nature. He wanted to share things. If he could help somebody, you know, he, he would. I know you hear that from a lot of, a lot of people mm-hmm. say that about other people, and I'm sure it's quite true. I've seen Dave on the floor with exhaustion, and he knew he had to do something, so he'd switch from that exhausted person to the person that was driven to do the right things, the right things in as much as I'm an artist, I'm a poet, maybe somebody out there might just want to buy a picture or put an exhibition on. It was almost like a childlike innocence driven by that extremes of having a childlike innocence knowing you have to be adult at the same time. In other words, a hard-nosed businessman who could easily crumble within a couple of minutes of being hurt by somebody and then hide away for two days. It was that roller coaster. And I, I hesitate to use the word extremist. That could sound like it's a criticism, but it's actually it's a, the exact opposite, actually. It was that extremism that drove him. And it was like when he was completely on the floor with exhaustion, to have the ability to switch sound that, ah, now I need to be the hard-nosed businessman. There's somebody over there I need to talk to you. And I'm still laying there thinking, I'm exhausted. How, how are you doing this, mate? You know, he had that. He had that drive. It was. It was. It was in in him. Yes, he lacked confidence, but it was almost like it was that psychological. I need to be a, appear as an extrovert, outlandish, outrageous person, because if I show you my real self, which is gullible and shy and lacking in confidence. You won't even talk to me. If I come up in your face as an outlandish, extrovert, outrageous person, you might just give me a bit of attention. Okay, when you get to know me, you'll realise I'm not that person. But in the meantime, we may have made that connection. Some of the things I'm saying it makes him, may, may make him sound like he was a user. He used people. He never used anyone. If you gave him something, he'd give you back more. Anyone that helped him, he'd help them more always sometimes even I have to pinch myself did it really happen did we have did did we really ever meet did we really become great friends is he dead 
but it's all happened it's all very real and it, all the memories but I wouldn't change a minute of it you know, I, I, we went all the way across London once he'd met a writer a female writer he said you've got to meet this one I said okay we've been invited for dinner okay well, that's good news okay an hour and a half Oh, a train and two buses, actually, to get uh-huh. there. We'd only been there about a quarter of an hour, and he said something that upset this person so much, she told us to leave. OK. <laughs> We'd only been there a quarter of an hour. It was pouring with rain. We had to go back outside, wait for a bus. Hungry, disappointed, really. I didn't know what to think. I was I was infuriated. I was really. I said we could all our way across London. Probably a, a good chance to to progress your career or my career, whatever. And we'd been thrown out. <laughs> you said something, but it, within probably by the end of the bus journey, we were laughing. I remember I remember laughing about it in the end. But it's that kind of thing. Yeah. That moment of infuriation to I laughter. Think, that could have been the big break. Yeah? But Dave. He, he was he was disappointed in himself, mm-hmm. very disappointed in himself that he mis- misread the situation, because he'd lost a friend. He'd made friends with this this one. He was the kind of guy that he had confidence, although he was very complex. Because although he was he wasn't very confident, he had confidence in his own ability, usually because he made it happen. It wouldn't just appear. It was usually because of all the effort. He was such a hard mm. worker. He wouldn't sponge off anyone. He wouldn't take anything off anyone unless he knew he could give it back and more. You know, sometimes when I was trying to be the the, the protector to guide us in a certain direction, I'd realised two things. A, I wasn't getting anywhere, and he was. And I wasn't having any fun, and he was. <laughs> <laughs> so who was right and who was wrong? <laughs> His approach worked. <laughs> His approach worked, yeah, absolutely. His approach worked. Um, yes, like I say, you've got to go through quite a few scrapes. Yeah. But the end goal yeah. worked for him because he lived the dream. He was, he was doing exactly what he wanted to do. You've been listening to a Bailiwick Express podcast. If you like what you heard, please share, like and subscribe so we at Bailiwick can continue to pull apart the stories that affect you, the listener. Thank you for joining us.